Thank you so much for joining us uh, again. We're about to start the program. My name is Francesco Spagnolo. I'm the curator of the Magnus. It's uh, wonderful to welcome you all to the last uh, uh, appointment in our series this year devoted to Arthur Schick. Uh, many of you, uh, I'm sure, already know the Magnus received in 2017 a, a, an unprecedented gift to purchase the Arthur Schick collection. And we are very hard at work in uh, cataloging, making it accessible. You see some highlights on the walls of this, uh, of this hall. And um, it's a distinct pleasure to host for this talk my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Shir Kojavi. Um, we refer to her as Shir, but she's really Dr. Kojavi, and she's a, a scholar of both uh, art history, and she's a legal scholar. She comes to us, she's, she works with us at Magnus. She comes to us with really a, an amazing array of expertise and, and abilities. And so she's, she's the one who's been diving into Arthur Schick's art for the last year and a half and, uh, and uh, studying its nuances. And today she's speaking about both the, the, the Judaica patterns, what, what was the repertoire of a Jewish artist in the earlier part of the 20th century, uh, but, but also uh, more, more generally, what, what, was, what were the patterns of collecting at that time? What was available in, in, in Judaica collections around Europe? So please join me in welcoming Shir Kuchavi to the podium. Thank you, Shir. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you all for joining us. So this is going to be the fourth and the last talk of this series around Arthur Schick. Uh, this talk will focus on a few of Schick's aesthetic ins is sorry, inspirations. It will be also divided into three parts. We'll begin with a short biography of Schick's early career years, followed by an exploration of some of his inspirations. In this portion, several, several European collections of Judaica and ancient Jewish manuscripts will be mentioned, all of which were catalogued and published or put on display for visitors during the 1920s and 1930s in Europe. This talk will end with some final thoughts about Arthur Schick and the artists of the Bezalel School of Jerusalem. I'll focus primarily on works by the artists of Chaim Moses Lilian and Zev Raban, both Polish natives who taught art at the Bezalel School in its early years in 1910s and 1920s. So let's begin. Arthur Schick was born in June of 1894 in Łódź, Poland. His family supported his ambition to become an artist and at the age of 16, he left to study in Paris at the famous Académie Julien, where artists such as Fernand Leger, Henri Matisse, and Jacques Lifshitz also, scholar, also studied he returned to Poland in 1913, and the following, the following year joined a group of young scholars traveling to Palestine. The outbreak of World War I in the summer of 1914 cut his visit short, and upon his return to Poland, he was drafted to the army. Several years later, in 1921, as a married man and a father to his son, George, he decided to move back to Paris with his, with his family. The following year, their daughter was born, Alexandra. They lived in Paris until 1933, and during these 12 years, Schick was able to develop a successful career by forming connections with local personalities and collectors who were often immigrants just like himself. While living in Paris, Schick became close with an antiques dealer, Auguste de Cour, who took upon himself to organize Schick's first local exhibitions. De Cour's clientele ranged from members of high society in Paris to wealthy foreigners who shared an admiration to medieval and Renaissance styles, and Schick, whose works were inspired by medieval manuscripts, as you will see in, in a moment, was supported financially by patr patrons such as Anatole de Monzy, a French politician who later even sent Schick to a visit in Morocco, and Baron Henri de Rothschild. In this example, you see um, to your left, an example from the statue of Kalish, a 12, uh, 1264 charter of Jewish liberties issued by Duke Boleslaus the Pious and was later sanctif sanctified by three Polish kings, uh, Casimir III in 1334, Casimir IV in 1453, and Sigismund I in 1539, if you wanted to know. 
Schick illustrated this work between 1926 and 27 as a reaction to Marshal Józef Pilsudski's 19, uh, 1926 coup d'etat in Poland, expressing a hope that Jews will be granted equal rights in the re-established Polish state. Next to this page, to your right, you'll see a page from the album L'Ornament et Brick, written by Baron David Gunzburg and Vladimir Vasilevich Stashov, published in 1905. This book is based on 13th century Hebrew-Spanish Hebrew biblical manuscripts from the Frikovich collection of the Imperial Public Library of St. Petersburg. It took the writers over a decade to complete. And these, this is just one example of some, of some of the works that were available and some of the publications that were available for Schick to get inspired of. In this example, on your left, is another page from L'Ornamente Break, and next to it, unfortunately, I only had an example in black and white, how very appropriate for today, uh, two Esther scrolls from the collection of the Berlin writer, Sally Kirsch Kirschstein. Kirschstein was born in Poland in 1869 and grew up to become a successful businessman in Berlin. In 1890, he started collecting Jewish ritual objects and published numerous essays on, on Jewish objects. His collection was open to the public in a museum set up in his garage in his Berlin house until 1926. In 1926, he decided to donate it to the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. And today, these objects, along with many others, are part of the Skirbel Museum collection in Los Angeles. In this last opulent example of manuscripts, uh, to your left, your far left, you see an example of the tripartite machzor, showing Ruth gleaning in the fields of Boaz. You'll notice that male figures have human heads, but the women are actually given the heads of various animals. Next to it is an Esther scroll from 18th century Salonika, found in our collection at the Magnus. And to your right, a 1946 border painting by Arthur Schick. On the bottom of the border, Schick depicted the lion wearing a crown and the deer holding together the Ten Commandments. This slide really brings us deeply into the second part of our presentation. This is another example of the depiction of lions holding the Ten Commandments, also found in, uh, in synagogues and on, uh, on Torah Ark uh, covers on the background of the portrait of Julia Schick on your left, and a menorah held by two lions on a book plate created by Schick for Le Livre d'Esther, the Book of Esther, in its 1925, 25th ed edition. Schick's works were not only aesthetically inspired by ancient manuscripts, they also incorporated several significant Jewish elements, as you can see here. A couple of these examples of the, and the qualities that were attached to these elements are something that I'd like to review with you. First of all, the lion. The lion symbolizes national redemption, a guardian of sacred treasures and places, and the sign of the tribe of Judah. A deer. The deer that we saw before symbolizes swiftness and love of Israel, and it's also the sign of the tribe of Naphtali. The crown symbolizes salvation, righteousness, and godliness. The menorah, an ancient uh, Hebrew lamp that was used in the holy temple. Later on, we'll, reach, we'll see two more examples. One, the six-pointed star, this, or the star of David, or the shield of David, which symbolizes certain different elements. On the one hand, the shield. On the other, in Kabbalah, it symbolizes the connection between the spiritual and the earthly. But the six-pointed star was actually never a unique Jewish symbol. It had significance for Christianity and in... Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm feeling a little tired today. And in Islam. It was only identified with modern Judaism after it was selected for the flag of the World Zionist Movement in 1897 for the first Zionist Congress in Basel. The second one, the word Zion. Zion is one of the seven names of Jerusalem, mentioned over 150 times in the Bible. 
The idea, the return to Zion, expresses a yearning to return to Jerusalem or to the Holy Land that was expressed primarily in 19th century and early 20th century. Here are a few uh, additional examples of Jewish ritual objects uh, that, were, that were known and probably familiar during the first half of the 20th century between certain Jewish circles of collectors and and secular um, members of the community. The first one, a Hanukkah lamp with the same emblems of the lion and the menorah in the center, belonged to Siegfried S. Strauss. Strauss began collecting Jewish objects in Germany in early 20th century, probably in 1913. He continued through the rise of the Nazi regime. Objects in his collection were probably purchased from German antiques and Judaica de dealers, primarily in Berlin. You'll, you'll be able to learn more information about him and his collection in our exhibition right behind you, Memory Objects, Judaica Collections and Global Migrations. Before he was interned in Buchenwald in 1938, Strauss secured safe passage for his collection, moving it to England. Once he was released, he followed it there and later brought it to the United States first to New York, and later to Los Angeles. Until finally, in 1968, the Magnus acquired more than 400 ritual objects, books, manuscripts, and other items from the Strauss collection, and it's here. To your left here, you'll see a Hanukkah lamp that belonged to French 19th century Judaica collector Isaac Strauss. This is not the same Strauss family that I just talked about, interestingly. Strauss was, um, was a French composer and a gifted violinist. He displayed his extensive Judaica collection in France and in England, and eventually donated it to the Cluny Museum of the Middle Ages in Paris. In our collection, we have a drawing by Schick who sketched the medieval architecture of the Cluny Museum. Therefore, we believe that Schick was probably exposed to the object in Strauss's collection at the museum at the time. To your right, another Hanukkah lamp created in Warsaw that is found today at the Jewish Museum in New York. This belonged to Benjamin Mintz, who was an antiques dealer in Warsaw in the beginning of the 20th century. He collected extraordinary Jewish ceremonial objects and paintings by Jewish artists. After giving up his business in the late 1930s, he and his wife received permission from the Polish government to escort the collection to the 1939 World, Exhibit, uh, World Fair in New York, the same World Fair that Arthur Schick exhibited several of his works. In. The Zionist couple planned to sell it in the United States in order to eventually fund their immigration to Palestine. However, the collection was eventually never exhibited in the World Fair, though it did arrive to New York with a couple. The art market was low at the time, and the couple who accompanied the collection were unable to sell it there. They remained in the United States and never made Aliyah to Israel as they planned. In 1947, uh, the husband, Benjamin, passed away, and his wife eventually sold the collection to the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. Here, our last example of the Judaica is on your left, a Torah shield that belonged to the Danzig or Gdansk collection. Since early, uh, since early 20th century, this collection consisted of two separate collections, Jewish ritual objects from the great synagogue of Danzig and the collection of Jewish ritual objects that belonged to Lesser Gildinsky, who was uh, born in 1830 and passed away in 1910. Gildinsky, decided to donate his collection to the Danzig community in 1904. He was a Jewish grain merchant and an amateur art collector who collected not only Jewish ritual objects, but also fine art, ceramics, jewelry, books, maps, etc. His collection was open for visitors for numerous years in his Danzig house. After his death in 1910, over 1,200 items were, sent, were put on, on auction in Berlin from his collection. The only portion of his collection that survived until this day is actually, actually the Judaica that was donated to the Danzig Synagogue. In the spring of 1939, the elders of the, of the Danzig community, assisted by the Joint Distribution Committee, 
collected all the communal possession and shipped it to the Jewish Theological Seminary. The collection was so well known that upon its arrival, a selection of objects were put on display in a shop window on Fifth Avenue in New York in 1939. It was put there for several weeks and afterwards was still available for the public at the Jewish Theological Seminary. The objects, however, were not given to the Jewish Theological Seminary permanently. It was decided that they would remain in New York only for a period of 15 years. Unfortunately, after 15 years and the outbreak of the Cold War, the items remained in the Jewish Museum and they're still there to today. There are numerous edition examples that could be relevant for this talk. There are several important additional collections, some that ended up in Jerusalem, uh, that were all collected around the 1920s and 30s and were brought together and shown to the public in different museums across Europe. But these are all a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. I'm happy to offer, offer more information about these later. Zion. This slide was selected purely for aesthetic sake. It's not like any of the others in this talk, based on the proximity of the location or the period, although they're all created in early 20th century. This offers you an interesting comparison of items from India and Persia or Iran, inspired by the wave of Zionism of early 20th century, and Sheikh's own aesthetic depiction of, that, of Zionist themes. The six-pointed star and the, world Zion, uh, sorry, the word Zion in its center, which as you see here, was a common expression of the yearning for Zion in early 20th century. Schick, who supported the Zionist movement and was friends with Zionist revisionist leader Zev Jabotinsky, <coughs> and later Peter Bergson and Ben Hecht, created numerous works in support of the Jewish immigration and settlement in Palestine and the foundation of a Jewish state. The example in this slide is one out of so many. The discussion on Sheikh's relationship with Zionism is a fascinating one, but again, will be saved for a separate long talk. In our third part, I'd like to discuss the influence of the Betelel School of Arts and Crafts in Jerusalem on Sheikh's works. The Betelel School of Arts and Crafts was funded in Jerusalem by the Lithuanian Jewish artist Boris Schatz in 1906. This school relied on the support of the Zionist movement and produced works in support of, Z of Zionist ideals and the Jewish return to the land of Israel. Betelel had societies working to raise funds for financial support while promoting its students. These societies and associations were active in Europe, especially in Germany and Poland and works by Betelel artists were advertised in different languages and sold in Jewish communities and by Zionist groups in a variety of shapes, forms, and sizes that they could even be ordered by at your leisure from your home. In this detail of a carpet made by the Betelel school, a carpet workshop, Marvadia, you can see once again the word Zion in the center of the six-pointed star, as, we, as we've seen before. I'm going to take you slightly back in time and, get, and return to 1914. I'd like to remind you that in the beginning of this talk, I shared with you that Schick traveled to Palestine that year, right before World War I. Two important Polish Jewish artists who set the tone for what we know today as the Betelel School works were Ephraim Moses Lillian, who was born in Dorchowicz in 1874, and Zev Raban, who was born in Łódź in 1890. Their works were inspired by the Art Nouveau movement that developed in France at the end of 19th century. Oh, sorry. Here are a couple of examples of the usage of the six-pointed star again, and the idea of Zion in works by Lillian, to your left, and by Raban, to your right who also depicts the lions in a similar way that Chick does. In this comparison, I chose to bring an example of Chick's, work, Chick's early works and Lillian's diasporic Jew, who's watching Jerusalem glow from a distance, while Chick's, while Chick's Moses is standing tall and firm. 
Both characters seems, seem to be held back by dry thorns, preventing them to move forward. forward. While the Jew in Lillian's depiction seems completely tied up, Moses looks as if he managed to release himself and moves forward holding the Ten Commandments and the menorah proudly. In these couple of examples, we return to the lion, the chick depicts in many, many of his works, side by side with a similar study by Zev Laban. I just couldn't ignore it. It was wonderful. A few of the drawings produced by Sheikh during his visit to Palestine have f very familiar resemblance to Bezalel works. For example, here on your, on your right, you see a piece that was painted on an undated postcard by Sheikh. It says Haifa, if you can identify it, and the year 191, and you can add, oops, it was, and you can add the additional, the additional number of the year but you actually don't have it filled in there. And next to it is a business card for uh, promoting the shop that was uh, made for Bezalel artworks in Jerusalem. Finally, I'm going to end as we approach Purim um, with an example of playing cards, of playful playing cards by Sheikh to your left and by Raban to your right. You see that both Sheik and Raban used Esther as one of their queens. Well, Raban's, were, Raban's cards were actually created during his lifetime. As far as we know, Sheik's cards were only produced later on. I hope this presentation was able to offer some insight on Sheik's decorative and conceptual inspirations and give you some context to his European surroundings, especially during the interwar period. The concepts discussed here today appear continuously in works created throughout Sheikh's lifetime. Thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to share the mic. So I'm quite interested in the use of the lions as opposed to the cherubim. Mm -hmm. um, that is the the lion. He seemed, Schick seemed to like the symbol of the lions. Clearly, it's quite prominent, right, in his work. Absolutely. And. Um, but I, I wondered at what point the lions replaced, if that's the right way to put it, mm -hmm. the idea of the two cherubim surrounding the ark or at the center of things. I mean, it seems like he used the lions, the crown, he sort of made a little thing there. Uh, yeah. Kind of, uh, I guess I just wondered how that worked for him. Absolutely. So I'll do my best to answer. Um, we do have over 400 works by Arthur Schick in our collection, but there are still many around there, and I'm relying on these 400 and works of 400 works of, and the research surrounding them to discuss this. Um, so in the in Schick's works, you don't see there's a slight difference between the 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 chaubim and and uh, the lions as far as as I learned it and understood it and understood it and please feel free to make any additional comments on this um, the kuvim or chaubim hold the ark itself and hold uh, the place where the two um, the ten commandments are situated and the lions here actually don't hold the ark. The lions are more as the guardians of the temple and of the place and of the object. The chaubim are more of the representatives who are coming to watch them when we were put there by God, perhaps. Um, so 
in the, the temple itself, well, the, after the temple was, was uh, built and the, the, temporary build, um, the temporary ark was moved into the temple from the desert location where Moses put it, the Chorobim and the ark were moved into it, but, they were, but the concept of the lions, which is also an, um, a concept that was taken from paganism originally, along with, the other, with several of the, of the other animals, like the deer, um, was brought in slightly later on and was used only in the later period. Did it help at all? Yeah, I mean... So earlier Chaubim, later lions, right, chic lions, I mean, other artists Chaubim. Yeah, so I mean, this, this um, kind of here, so like many people, I have one. Like, mm -hmm. uh, They, were, they came at a bit of a different, they came as more of a decorative ele element, it's a bit of a, dif of a different time. Yeah. They don't appear in the Bible in the same right. context as right. the Chauvin. Right. In the painting over there, Poland under threat, in the upper left hand corner, it's, can you translate what, what does it have to do with Marikonsky? Sorry, I didn't hear you properly. The, the, uh, up in the upper left-hand corner is text, and it refers, refers to the Amerikansky. And is that having to do with the, the airplanes? Yeah. So this work? Um, so this work was created as part of a series of works of the bar Brotherhood in Arms between Poland and, and America and other, several other nations are mentioned in it. Um, and in several of these pieces, you'll see the reference to a medieval ruler or a medieval character, important medieval character. And surrounding it in the background and on the sides, you'll see references to modernism, whether it's the airplanes, the trains, uh, the tanks, um, etc. The text here references the, the title of the piece and the, and the idea of the brotherhood in arm and their, the close relationship and the, the friendship between the two countries, Pol Poland and, and the United States. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I wish my question were more important after all this. So often when speaking of Schick, you hear about medieval illumination, medieval manuscripts. Was that very innovative as far as what he was doing or were other artists also doing this? Thank you so much for this question. Um, in late 19th century, a wave of, uh, of and a new interest in collecting emerged, especially in, uh, in Europe a lot. Very, it was very substantial in England and in France. Uh, collectors were attracted once and interested once again in medievalism and in Renaissance and started collecting again uh, pieces that came, out, came up in auction from these periods. Um, it's, it's an interesting time, an interesting time for collecting and chic who, uh, if you look at the period of his lifetime and you compare him to other artists who were living at the time, really uh, tried to set aside avant-garde movements and other uh, type of very important developing uh, changes in the art world that occurred in Paris at the same time that he was living there. So, in my opinion and the way that I see it, well, he was, he had a sense of innovation and I'm sure that his inspiration from potentially Hebrew manuscripts as well as, um, as Christian um, medieval manuscripts was extremely significant and appears on and on throughout uh, his lifetime in a variety of his works it's in some that you see on the walls here. Um, I think he wasn't uh, standing alone, completely alone in that, in that realm. I think um, he found a very, very smart and niche and he, uh, he 
appealed to a certain type of patronage that developed out of this, this group of collectors of the late 19th century who were interested in that, in specifically these kinds of items. And one of his patrons uh, in the early 1920s was actually a man called Harry Glamby, who was an American collector living in, in Paris with his wife. And he purchased almost all of the, I think all of the pieces of his first exhibition at the uh, Cour Gallery in 1922. And um, I did a little bit of research because I never heard of this Harry Glamby. Harry Glamby met, made a lot of money by developing and selling hairnets. <laughs> Unfortunately, at some point, hairnets became very unsuccessful and in addition to that, he went into a very significant hardship and he was robbed. Somebody came into his house and robbed his wife's jewelry and ro robbed a lot of things. There are actually articles that you can find online about this and an interview with his very, very petrified wife. He ended up selling um, a lot of his collection and luckily for us, the auction catalog from the um, early 1960s or the late 1950s, if I'm not mistaken, which is after Schick passed away, um, actually has photographs of several rooms in his house of his collection and the type of, types of objects there. And you can see that they're very heavy wooden objects. And when you think of the display of Schick's works in that context, it actually works very nicely and you can compare it to medieval castles, for example. Thank you very much for your very informative talk. Um, I have a question. You had mentioned that, um, maybe I didn't catch it correctly, that, um, that items from the Danzig Synagogue are still resident in the United States. Correct. I don't know what happened to the Jewish population in Danzig, but is there a synagogue there now? Is there any chance that they would want it back? Or, I mean, th there's a lot of talk about giving artifacts back to people who own them. Mm -hmm. So maybe it works the other way also. I mean, mostly we're thinking about Jewish families who had, had, were pilfered by the, by the Nazis. And this, this may be maybe something that we should give back to Danzig. What, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. My kind of question. Thank you. Um, the, it's very true. There are several Jewish communities today who, have, who are actually um, considered to be new communities that were established or, re, or well, it's not exactly re-established. They were established after the Holocaust. Um, some of them were re-established only after the Cold War. And today they're asking for some of their ritual objects to be returned. Uh, there's actually a very important case against the Israel Museum uh, with a community in, um, in the Netherlands that for several years has been trying to get a parochet back for their synagogue. And there are several additional cases such as this one. The dancing community um, story is slightly different. And as far as I know, and from the little communication and the little work that I did um, in my exper past experience with the Jewish Museum, they did not request uh, to return the collections. Uh, despite the 15-year uh, limit. I, I can only speculate on what are the reasons for them not to ask for, for the return. Uh, there, the Danzig collection, if you search, if, even if you just search online on the Jewish Museum database, they're, they're splendid objects. They're made of, they're gilded, they're made of silver, they're, they're very expensive objects. Um, I don't know if the collection can upkeep this amount of objects in this type of collection today. I, I really don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Today, there are all kinds of implications that include robbery, insurance, shipping, etc. that while they were considered at the time, today they are much more consider considerable. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how I... <laughs> I would have loved to see them go back, but I, it's just not the case. Didn't we have a speaker, <laughs> we have a speaker uh, from a uh, well, couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and he talked about the Danzig yeah. uh, collection, and yeah. they really kind of wanted it to stay. 
-hmm. although some of the gold cup was stolen. Yes. I don't know if it was part of the Danzig uh, collection. It's, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and he was asking, where's that cup? And he was told it was stolen. So, uh, exactly. you know, people who owned it realize it, I think, that in order to preserve it, they have to have a safe place. Mm -hmm. uh, safer, maybe it's not a safe place if it's stolen, but uh, maybe a little safer. <laughs> <laughs> so let me reply with a question. <laughs> Allow me to reply with a question. Yes. Is it better for these, and you, nobody's expected to answer this, because I definitely can't. Are these ob objects better off in a museum or in storage in a museum, or are they better off in a living community, community where they can be seen and celebrated, perhaps, during the high holidays? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes to which? <laughs> But yeah, they could share them. You just referred in passing a few minutes ago to a 15-year limit? Yep. And I don't know what you were referring to. The Danzig collection. Uh, when the Danzig um, community uh, Jewish ritual objects collection was sent to, <laughs> New York, to New York in 1939, uh, the community limited the period of time that the collection will remain in New York at the hands of the Jewish Theological Seminary to 15 years. Unless the war pursues and continues beyond the time limit of 15 years. But 15 years after 1939, um, the World War II had already ended and the Cold War was beginning. And so the collection remained at the Jewish Museum in New York until this day. Okay, thank you very much for coming.